Hi hey everyone, today's painting is about a conversion story. You might guess who it could be. It's from the Acts of the Apostles. So our painting is from a church in Rome, Italy, and it's quite famous. Um, you might learn, get some insights into the artist uh, and how he tried to depict the story, how he tries to capture your attention and even the scene. So you might have guessed what it already is, but we're back again with our Truth and Beauty series in the Lexio Evangelization Bible Study. So some of us are doing it and we're trying to learn more about how the first evangelizers did it and how can we um, learn from them how we could evangelize today. Today's story depicted in this painting of the conversion of St. Paul is really an important one when we think about conversions. So in the back of your mind, as we talk about this painting, think about what has been your conversion experience? Could you share that with someone else? Because St. Paul does it numerous times in scripture. So we're following the Acts of the Apostles, and this painting is actually in the Sarasi Chapel, in the Church of Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome, Italy. Uh, I wanted to give you an idea of what that church might look like, so I found something that I could show you. So you see here the church, and we're talking about a painting that Caravaggio did in 1601. So as we enter into this story and learn more about this conversion of Saul to Paul, uh, we look at what it might be like to be one of those medieval pilgrims that you've saved money for years to make a pilgrimage to Rome. You traveled on foot, maybe from Spain or France, walking for months in order to pray at this holy site of the Eternal City. And you finally arrive at the city of the martyrs and enter the first church you see inside the city walls, the church of Santa Maria del Popolo. You stop in awe before Caravaggio's paintings of the conversion of St. Paul and the crucifixion of St. Peter, which are both displayed in the church's Sarasi side chapel. You have come to Rome to see the tombs of St. And Peter and Paul, the founders of the church in Rome, and now you're confronted with these scenes of St. Paul's conversion and St. Peter's martyrdom. After praying at these images, you bring the fruit of your meditation um, as conversion and martyrdom with you as you make your pilgrimage through Rome, visiting those holy sites and allowing God's grace to bring you to deeper conversion and prepare you to lay down your own life, even to the point of martyrdom if necessary. This could be very hard for us to imagine in this day, but there are martyrdom happening even today. So as we look at Caravaggio's painting, we encounter uh, the greatest evangelist in history. Like everything about Paul, previously called Saul, was intense. His, ac his accomplishments as a brilliant young Jewish scholar, to the ferocity which, with which he virulently perse persecuted the new sect that followed the crucified Jesus. Um, it would seem that capturing the attention of this man as he was breathing murderous threats against Christians would really necessitate, necessitate a great event. His conversion would have to be pretty big, I think. So Caravaggio uh, does justice to this dramatic encounter between Jesus and Saul. He uses intense and even violent gestures to demonstrate the action in this work. The painter portrays the decisive moment from the account of Saul's conversion when asked about him and he hears God's voice calling, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In this moment, Saul has just been thrown from his horse. His arms are outstretched as he falls to the ground. His eyes are closed. He seems to be in the midst of a revelation. The intensity of emotion and drama depicted draws the viewer into the painting, allowing him to participate in the event. 
We're not supposed to be passive viewers of this work. When we see sacred art, we should be drawn in somehow and transported to the scene. So notice how Caravaggio uses every bit of available space, and I've zoomed in here so that you could uh, really see the light and um, position of the arms and the legs. Uh, so we'll look at those in closer um, pictures too in a second. These figures are practically bursting off of the canvas as if coming out of the frame to us. The viewer's at eye level with St. Paul. You can almost feel his body breaking through the bottom of the painting, coming into our space and reminding us that the conversion of Paul and the events of scripture are not merely historical events. They're not just something that happened in history a long time ago. They matter today. So they are part of our story and we're asked to participate in them, to meditate on them, and to allow Jesus to bring us to conversion every time we look at them. So let's go a little bit deeper. Caravaggio, known for his chiaroscuro technique, which in Italian, chiaro means light and scuro means darkness. He uses light and darkness in a striking and original way. Light has a particular significance in Christian thought and the scriptures. Uh, we have images of light. Jesus is the light of wor the world. Uh, we talk about light and darkness um, in sin and happiness. Um, so those images uh, that we talk about for light are very important. The symbolism re representing the illumination and the revelation of God's word. Prophetic writers like Isaiah describe Israel as a light to the nations. And Jesus, of course, like I said, says, I am the light of the world in the book of John. Caravaggio uses light in a particular way, in a way that manifests this Christian understanding. Caravaggio utilizes light to represent the supernatural, which overcomes the darkness. This is a very important point when we are thinking about our faith and especially conversion, where we're entering into the light and this dramatic shift in the way that we look at the world, which obviously happened for Saul as he encounters this great light. Caravaggio's solid and very much three-dimensional figures are enhanced by the strong light that falls on them. He uses light to isolate and direct the viewer's attention. So we see the light on the fallen Saul, but we don't see its source. The focus is on his experience of the light of his heavenly vision. So if he sees this flash of light and hears the voice of the Lord, um, what does this do for him? How can we enter into this experience? It, can you imagine yourself in this fall being knocked to the ground? Um, he does see a flash of light and he hears the voice of the Lord, but he's struck blind for three days, symbolizing the state of his soul before his revelation. And for me, those three days always point back to the days in the tomb, Lazarus, the, the fact that when Christ or God brings you back, you're in a whole new life now. You've, you were dead in sin or you were dead in your error, um, the error of your ways, and now you are brought into the light and your life has changed forever. That experience of conversion is something that we all need, uh, no matter where we come from or at what point we are in our faith. Uh, so when we... Uh, think about this, it's only by the gift of the Holy Spirit who leads to the light of truth, given at the laying on of Ananias's, Ananias's hands, will St. Paul regain his sight. So Caravaggio allows us to be bathed in this heavenly light that dispels the darkness of Saul's soul, giving him the light of life. So you're called to think about whether you've experienced the first-hand uh, revelation of God, where it's light and illuminating to you. I always think of those aha moments, those moments of inspiration where the Holy Spirit kind of enters in and says, 
wait a minute, did you see this? Um, that this light is very important in the way that the artist Caravaggio portrays um, this significant event in Saul's life. Just to close up, I thought I would share with you um, some exegesis that I did on my own. Besides going into the scriptures and trying to understand them, I had heard long ago that, you know, St. Paul probably wasn't riding a horse um, at this time when he was on the road to Damascus. So I tried to uh, investigate. I used Google. I did find an article from Catholic Answers that I thought was interesting. Uh, it is titled, Did Saul Actually Fall Off His Horse on the Road to Damascus? And um, there are a couple of reasons that they think that he probably wasn't on his horse, which I found interesting and thought I would share with you. So in the three accounts of Saul's miraculous conversion, there are actually three of them in Acts chapter 9, chapter 22, and 26. Um, mainly in scripture, it says that upon seeing the light from heaven, he falls to the ground. Most people assume that because Saul was en route to Dis Damascus, he must have been traveling by horse at the moment when he had this happen to him and this blinding light knocked him off his horse and he fell to the ground. Uh, they say that this is highly improbable and the reason being that um, St. Luke, the author of Acts, in two of his three accounts of the conversion of Saul, furnishes us with a clue that sheds light on what Saul was more than likely doing when he fell to the ground. See if you can pick it out. So I have some scriptures that I'm going to read to you here, the examples. Uh, Acts 22, as I made my journey and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone about me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The second, um, excerpt from scripture is from Acts 26. Thus I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now in, in these two scriptures, besides um, the first one from Acts 9 that I mentioned earlier. These passages establish the exact time of day when this heavenly light appeared that caused him to fall to the ground and it was midday. Um, we would think that if it was noon, it was the heat of the day, maybe even the brightest time of the day. Um, it's an important detail. So commentators point out that this was a way to show that there was no delusion from nightly appearances. So if there was a bright light at night, that kind of makes sense. Any light would look bright to you amidst the darkness and could be even blinding. So think of like, you know, if you have a flashlight, um, I know when we've gone camping, camping and somebody like flashes a light in front of you, um, it's actually blinding for a moment until your eyes can adjust again. So um, it was broad daylight and his eyes could not have played tricks on him. Some people posit the theory that Saul was more than likely not riding a, a horse at noon because of prayer time. So there was an established time and Pharisees, which um, Saul was a Pharisee at the time, had uh, three times during the day that they would pray in the imitation of King David. So when you heard that scripture, you said it said, O King which could be a clue also. In Psalms we hear, but I call upon God and the Lord will save me evening and morning and at noon in Psalm uh, chapter 55. So the, these three times were nine in the morning, which was their third hour of the day. The sixth hour was at 12 o'clock and the ninth hour was hour three in the afternoon, which was the time of the evening sacrifice. And you could see that also mentioned in Acts chapter 10. It sounds very strange to us to break up your day that way, but in this, you know, ancient time 2,000 years ago or even greater for those Hebrews or Jewish men that would be reciting these prayers, they would have st been standing on their feet and facing toward Jerusalem, as was their custom. And you could even see that in the book of Daniel. So we've been carrying on these traditions of prayer for uh, a long, long time. So they, using these clues, 
as you do a um, maybe more of an archaeological dive into um, scripture, you focus on those details, which I also find very interesting. So um, Dr. Taylor Marshall also suggests this in the book on the Catholic perspective on Paul, that it would be quite possible that Saul, the zealous Pharisee that he was, because he was he had a very strong faith, and that was why um, he was defending it so vigorously. He would have observed midday prayer on that day, so he would not have been um, on a horse at the time. Or other uh, script, um, other uh, dives into history for me had brought that wealthy people at the time may have had horses and would have traveled by horse. So we don't really know, but based on scripture, we can um, make some illusions to what we think might have happened. And the points in our artwork today is more about the impact of the experience of Paul. And it might have been logical to Caravaggio at the time to imagine him riding a horse and maybe the fall could be better portrayed if you fell off your horse. So I don't know if you um, have ever fallen off a horse. I have a couple of times, and I don't think that it was a very pleasant experience and it's very shocking and it can very much like even knock the wind out of you. So I can imagine what that fall could be like, but we're drawn into this picture to try and figure out if we, as personally can um, imagine what it would be like to have that amazing of a conversion experience where you hear the voice of Christ saying, why are you persecuting me? And what would that mean to you? And following that story, it's a really good story to um, follow to see how St. Paul goes to Ananias um, and he's blind this whole time now, and Ananias um, is able to bring his sight back to him and scale, like scales fall from his eyes. And then he goes to learn more about Jesus from uh, the apostles. So I think it's a great story, a great conversion story for anyone to look at. Peace be with you. And um, I hope that you'll join me in the next Art Reflection from the Lexio Evangelization series.